This afternoon is a topic that many, many people find fascinating. Many ideas floating around about Antichrist. So we're going to understand that this afternoon in our two sessions. First of all, we want to look at the Antichrist exposed. In other words, who or what is Antichrist? Now, we're going to take a fascinating journey with the prophet Daniel this afternoon. And uh, we're going to see some things that perhaps we had never seen before. So we need to ask God to guide us and to help us in this vital topic because it's one of the most important topics. This is Antichrist. This is something that is opposed to Jesus Christ himself. So we need to make sure we can understand very clearly. Let's just bow together and ask God's help this afternoon. Father in heaven, there are many ideas about Antichrist floating around. And this is a vital topic because it has everything to do with opposition to Jesus Christ. So open our minds. May we be willing to understand your word because your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Please help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I was living in Fiji a few years ago and fascinated to see a newspaper traveling around the countryside about this guy on the far left here, Salmon Lee, who had 666 stamped on his forehead. This was supposed to be Antichrist. Well, there's been a lot of ideas of who or what is Antichrist. I noticed that some people thought Prince Charles was Antichrist. I'm not sure why that was the case, but that was their viewpoint. Henry Kissinger here on your far right, Uh, from the United States, former, what would you call him, Bob? He's sort of like the, yeah, he was a politician. He was the advisor to the the president back a few years ago there. They said he was the Antichrist that even poor old Bill Clinton got in on as being called the Antichrist. On the eve of the year 2000, I noticed that the uh, Bulletin magazine had all these different ideas that people say about Antichrist. Many people believe, many Christians believe that Antichrist is some sort of a future atheistic dictator who will have a great impact in the end of time. What is the truth about all of this? How would we know? Well, let me tell you, the only place we would really know is from this book. It's not good enough to say, well, Tom, Dick or Harry says or whoever, whatever, Rather, what does this book say? Because this is where the word Antichrist come from, the Bible. It has tremendous help for us in this area. So who or what is the Antichrist? Let's take that first of all this afternoon. We want to look first of all at the meaning of Antichrist. The word anti means something that is opposed to, something that is against. Antichrist, against Christ. It also means that which is opposed to Christ and even means in the place of Christ. In other words, standing in where Christ should be standing. These are the ideas of the Greek word anti. Now, there are certain New Testament principles. The word antichrist itself is actually only found in the New Testament by name and only found in the writings of John and only found in his letters. But that doesn't mean Antichrist is not discussed elsewhere. In fact, Paul discusses Antichrist. He calls it the man of sin, as we'll see in a moment. John also in his revelation talks about Antichrist. But they all actually draw from the prophet Daniel, as we'll see in a moment too. These are the New Testament principles that are shared with us in the Bible. So let's look at those first of all. Then we'll go back to the book of Daniel. Number one. He is Antichrist because he is against Christ's followers. You may remember these words. Well, in Revelation 13, if you've read that chapter, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. John is talking about Antichrist here, and he makes war with God's people. Perhaps you've read the story of Paul, who was on the road to Damascus, to persecute the Christians, the church of Christ. And Jesus met him there and he asked him this cryptic question, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, Paul wasn't persecuting Jesus per se himself. 
Jesus was in heaven. But he said, you are persecuting me when you attack my people, you're against me. You notice the closeness between Christ and his people. To attack Christ's people is to be opposed or to be anti-Christ. This is one of the great principles we find in the New Testament. Saul, why do you persecute me? I'm not. I'm persecuting your church. Yes, that's me, my body. That's part of me. It is antichrist because it's not only against Christ's people, but he is against Christ's laws. Notice what the Bible says. This is Paul now. Paul's antichrist, that what he mentions about antichrist is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Don't let anyone deceive you, says Paul, in any way. For that day, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, he says, that day will not come before the rebellion. That word rebellion means, is, is the Greek word apostasy, a falling away, a turning from God. That day will not come before the rebellion occurs and the man of sin. That's Paul's term for antichrist, though he doesn't use the term. The man of sin is revealed. He says, the man doomed to destruction. Now, what is sin? Well, you remember we took a whole program on the law of God and how the commandments protect and preserve our most important relationships in life. And during that program, we saw how the Bible defines sin. Sin is the transgression or the breaking of the law of God. Sin is that. Now, sin, in other words, we saw, is lawlessness or breaking God's laws. That's how the Bible defines sin. Now, when we sin, whose laws do we break? Well, of course, we break the laws of Christ. Jesus said, if you love me, Jesus talking, keep my commandments. You see, the Bible makes it very plain that Christ is the lawgiver. The one who was with Israel in Sinai was the pre-incarnate Christ. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, when he talks about how Moses got water out of the rock, Paul says these words. He says, all drank the same spiritual drink. They drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ, he says, the pre-incarnate Christ before he became a human being. Christ is the lawgiver. They're his laws. So if we're opposed to the law of Christ, we're opposed to Christ, if we're opposed to his laws. That's why Antichrist is against Christ's laws. Now, here's something that may surprise people. Antichrist appears before Christ's return. We just read it a moment ago. Don't let anyone deceive you, said Paul, in any way. That day, and he's talking about the return of Jesus Christ to gather his people. That day will not come before. So it's not going to happen before that, before the rebellion occurs and the man of sin or Antichrist is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. So Antichrist appears before Christ comes, according to Paul. Finally, Antichrist had already begun in the New Testament times. Some people think it's in the future. No, not according to the Bible. He had already started in New Testament times. Notice what the Bible says. Antichrist, John is talking here. Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. John could say that back in his day. It's on its way, in other words. Paul wrote it this way when he's talking about the Antichrist, the man of sin. He says, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And he's writing 2,000 years ago. So it had started. Oh, it was going to be growing more, but it had begun way back then. Now, the last point, and this is surprising, Antichrist has Christian origins. Notice what the Bible says here. John is writing, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many antichrists have come. They went out from us, from us Christians. He says, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they, he says, would have continued with us. But it has the origins from within the Christian church. Paul taught the same thing. Come with me to Miletus. Miletus is in Turkey, not that far from Ephesus. Good drive. 
But Miletus was a place where Paul came one day on his way to Jerusalem and as he stopped at this place, he called for the elders of the church from Ephesus and they came and met with Paul and notice what Paul said to them on this occasion. Also from among yourselves, from within you Christian people, he's saying, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. So even Paul gave this principle that actually these things come from within the Christian church, just like John said, they came, went out from us, they came from us, and so on. All right, now, so here are, in summary, are the New Testament principles of Antichrist. Let's put them up again quickly. Number one, he's Antichrist because he's against Christ's followers, not just against Christ himself. He's Antichrist because he's against Christ's laws his principles of the Ten Commandments and so on. He's Antichrist. Antichrist appears before the return of the Christ. Antichrist, the Bible says, began in New Testament times. It had already started, going to grow much bigger, but it had begun. And it has Christian origins. These are the principles that the New Testament shares with us. Now, as I indicated, the New Testament references to antichrist or the equivalent the man of sin or whatever they are all coming from the same place from the prophet daniel that's where they are getting their information so we need to go back to the book of daniel so we can see what daniel said and then we'll be able to put all of this together very clearly we'll come back to revelation again next weekend to understand some more things about antichrist as well in Revel daniel chapter 7 Daniel had his second vision. He saw four great beasts come up from the ocean. One was like a lion with eagle's wings. There was a bear raised up on one side with three ribs in its mouth. There was a four-headed leopard with six wings. And there was a horrible beast with great teeth, ten horns, and so on. This is what Daniel saw. Now, the Bible tells us that the beasts represent kingdoms. Daniel gives us that key here. He explains the symbol of a beast. The fourth beast, he says, shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. So a beast represents a kingdom. When the Bible uses a beast to represent it, it's not sort of being nasty or derogatory. We even use beasts today to represent nations, do we not? If we uh, saw a cartoon or a drawing or a picture and around a table there was an eagle and a kangaroo, and this fellow here on the right here, what's the bird? Which one? Oh, that's got some of us tricked, hasn't it? All right, let's put them up. What, what, what would we say? We would say there's three powers sitting around having a conference. Who would the eagle be? Well, that's easy, isn't it? United States of America. Who would the kangaroo be? I wonder who that could possibly be. Well, that's Australia. What about this character here? What about this one? This is Papua New Guinea. Their great bird of paradise and so on. So here we are with these three names. Now, you see, we use that idea today. Well, the Bible used beasts to represent kingdoms or empires a long ago, and Daniel brings that to light in his prophecies. So the first beast that emerges is a lion with eagle's wings. This represents the power of Babylon. It's very interesting when you go to see some of the things that came out of Babylon. Remember the Ishtar gates. We showed a corridor coming or a processional way coming from the Ishtar gates. And there were some lions and you can see it more clearly here. They have wings on them, these lions. You see, the idea of a lion with eagle's wings was right there in ancient Babylon. And God says this represents the great power of Babylon what was in control when Daniel was given this vision, the Babylonian kingdom. But then came a bear. Interestingly, the bear was raised up on one side, was higher than the other. Why? Because first of all, the Medes were the dominant power in that dual empire but as time went on the Persians became stronger the three ribs represent the great powers that the Medo-Persians conquered the greatest powers number one you have what you had the great kingdom of Lydia in Turkey you had Babylon itself was conquered by the Medes and you also had the Egyptians another great superpower down 
south further. These are represented by the three ribs in the mouth of this bear. But then he saw this four-headed leopard. This is the kingdom of Greece. Why six wings? Well, this thing, this thing means it came through rapidly. And that's exactly what happened when Alexander the Great came to power. You remember, very swiftly, he conquered the Medo-Persian kingdom rapidly. Why four heads? Well, we saw in the chapter 8 of Daniel, he was already named in 200 years before they came, but we saw there that when Alexander the Great died, Greece was divided into four. So the wings represent speed, but the four heads represent the four divisions. Alexander's generals took over the Greek empire and all they did was divide it into four. That's why the four heads represented, uh, are representing these divisions of Greece. And these were the generals that divided up Greece. But then came this beast with giant teeth and so on. This is the kingdom that overtook the Greek empire, the great Roman empire. But Daniel was more interested in the ten horns on that fourth beast. Notice what he says. He says, the ten horns are ten kings which shall arise from this kingdom. So the whole thing is Roman. But here we have ten horns now that come out of the Roman empire, he says. Now you will recall when we studied that great image with feet of t- toes and feet of iron and clay we notice that it was those Germanic tribes that carved up the western Roman empire so much so that Rome became divided and uh, out of that we have what we call today western Europe we notice that in our first program but he was even more interested in one little horn that came to power among the ten horns notice what Daniel saw next What is this little horn that comes up? He says, I was considering the horns. That's the ten. And there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, among the ten. Before whom, he says, three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. So as this one came up, three got uprooted, three of the ten. And there in this horn, he says, were eyes like the eyes of a man. And a mouth, he said, speaking pompous or blasphemous or boastful words. He shall speak pompous words against the most high. Interesting term, against the most high. This little horn is against the the Most High. That's a significant phrase right there. Who is this Most High that he's against? Well, we discover uh, who this refers to. This refers to the Son of Man. Because when we go to Daniel chapter 7, we notice these words. I was watching, he says, in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, It says, then to him, the Son of Man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, just like he was given the kingdom in Daniel chapter 2. That rock became a huge mountain and filled the world. Then all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Notice those words that Daniel said, this being... This being, he says, that's what he saw. The Son of Man, all that happened to him. So let's notice what, let's summarize it. Number one, the Son of Man in Daniel 7 is given an eternal kingdom that will never end. Second thing, everybody serves or worships Jesus, though the Son of Man here. Now, when we look a little more into Daniel 7, we encounter that he's also called the Most High in the same chapter. Notice what it says. The Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. What is said of the Son of Man is exactly said of the Most High. In other words, the Son of Man is the Most High, and that should not surprise us, because 
when you go to the New Testament and you read the New Testament quotations of the Old Testament passages dealing with Jehovah, they apply them to Jesus Christ himself. The Son of Man is the Most High in Daniel 7. And of course, you know, the phrase Son of Man was the most favorite term that Jesus used for himself. He said, the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father. The Son of Man. What was he saying? That he's not only God, but human. Oh, that's a part of it. But what he's saying, that being in Daniel's prophecies, that's me. I am claiming to be that Son of Man. God in human flesh, yes, but I'm claiming to be the Daniel, son of man. So in other words, this little horn is against the most high. What does that mean? In that same chapter, it means he's against the son of man. And what does that mean? It means he's against Christ. That's why the New Testament writers, when talking of the Antichrist, they are referring to Daniel 7 because that's exactly what Daniel 7 is telling us. So this power, this little horn, is none other than Antichrist. That's the picture we have in Daniel. But who is the Antichrist? That question is still open, isn't it? You can start to see a little bit here now as we look at the Antichrist's agenda, what he's up to in Daniel 7, and we'll come back here a little more detail later on, but you will notice two things stand out in Daniel chapter 7 that this Antichrist or this little horn is doing. Notice number one, he is against Christ's laws in this very chapter. Notice what the Bible says. He, that's the Little horn, the Antichrist, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High and shall intend to change what? Times and laws. And he's talking about the context. That means the Most High's times and laws. That's what he's saying here. This power is opposed to or it wants to change God's time and laws. He is Antichrist, therefore, because they are God's laws. Number two, Antichrist in Daniel 7 is against Christ's people. Notice what Daniel sees. He says, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High and shall persecute the saints or the people of the Most High. What do you notice here in Daniel 7? We notice exactly what we saw in the beginning from the New Testament. This power is the same as what the New Testament is talking about because those were the two principles. Why is he Antichrist? He's against Christ's laws. Why is he Antichrist? He's against Christ's people. They're his people, so to be against them is to be against Christ. They're his laws. To be against the laws is to be against Christ. This is why the New Testament is really drawing from Daniel as you can see very clearly here. All right, but who or what is this Antichrist? How would we understand this? Well, we need to go back this afternoon and do some university history. This is University History 101 this afternoon. We're going to do a quick flyover of Christian history so that we can understand very clearly what's going on here. So let's hold on to our seats for a moment and let's do just a quick rundown of what happened in the Christian church through the centuries so we can get an idea of what Daniel is really talking about here. Now, you will remember that Christianity began right here in Jerusalem, right there in Israel. That's where it all began. Jesus crucified in Jerusalem. The disciples began to spread the gospel right there first in Jerusalem. Quickly it spread up to Antioch in Syria. And then they took it, especially through Paul, to Turkey or what the Bible calls Asia Minor. Then Paul took it to Greece. It spread also down into Egypt to Alexandria and so on. And then finally it was planted right in the heart of the Roman Empire in Rome itself all within the spaces we saw last week of the first 100 years and even less. But then came 70 AD. Up until this point in time, the center of Christianity had been Jerusalem. That was the headquarters. You may recall in the book of Acts chapter 15, when they had a council for the church, they met in Jerusalem. It's called the Jerusalem Council. 
But when 70 AD came along and Jerusalem was destroyed, no longer, obviously, was Jerusalem able to be the center. And increasingly, the center of Christianity moved from Jerusalem, especially after its demise, it became the center there in Rome. This became the center, most important site within Christianity. Now, of course, this is in the heart of the Roman Empire. It is surrounded by paganism right there in the center of Rome. And sadly, Christianity in Rome became increasingly influenced by pagan beliefs. And we noticed that last weekend. Now we come to the year 313 AD. We're right here now at the Milvian Bridge. Because at this bridge here in Rome, a significant battle took place. History tells us that in the year 313 AD, Constantine was to do battle the next day with Maxentius. They were going to fight and they ended up fighting here at the Milvian Bridge. The Emperor Constantine that night before the battle tells us, he says, I had a dream and in my dream I saw a cross and I was told by this sign you will conquer, he says. So when he woke up he thought, well, I want to win the battle the next day, so I better put the cross on my standards and my shields and so on. And so he had his soldiers do that. And you guess the next day when they had this big fight at the battle at the Milvian Bridge, Constantine defeated Maxentius and he became the Roman emperor now there in the great uh, empire of Rome. And eventually he himself became a Christian. But in a very short space of time after he defeated the Maxentius at that bridge, he believed that it was the cross that gave him the victory. So that's why he now became favorable, he says, toward Christianity. And Christianity, by the year 324 AD, just a few years later, it becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire. But not so many years before, it had persecuted Christians as we saw last week. But now it is the official religion of the Roman Empire. So in actual fact, Rome became Christian, but Christianity paid a high price for this interesting alliance, so to speak, with Constantine. Christianity became pagan, meaning that pagan beliefs now came into the church. In fact, they flooded the Christian church. Let me put up that statement that I read you last weekend. Remember what historians tell us about this very period we're looking at. These new Christians, these pagans who became Christian overnight. In fact, uh, we're told that Constantine uh, rode his soldiers or took his soldiers through the river to baptize them, all sort of thing. Very, you know, I mean, the guys hadn't even really believed, but that's just what they now became Christian in name. The new Christians, tell, the historians reveal to us, were, as far as thinking and habits were, the same old pagans. Nothing had changed inside. Their surge into the churches did not wipe out paganism in the church now or in Rome. On the contrary, the opposite, he says. Hordes of baptized pagans meant that paganism had diluted the moral energies of organized Christianity to the point of impotence. In other words, they brought with them their beliefs, their practices, and these became absorbed into Christianity. And they diluted the power of the gospel. This is the sad reality of what took place back at the time of Constantine. And it flooded into the Christian church. Now, you remember we mentioned in the first program that the Western Roman Empire collapsed between 351 and 476 AD. This is what happened. Gradually, gradually, those Germanic tribes started to carve up the Western Roman Empire. And as we mentioned, the Anglo-Saxons up there became the, the English and the Visigoths became the Spanish and so on. Now, the emperors, and Constantine was the first one, they moved their capital from Rome to Constantinople, or what we call Istanbul today. Constantine could see, because of what was already starting, thanks to these Germanic tribes, he could see that the future of the Roman Empire lay not in the west, but in the east. Not in Europe, but in Turkey. 
And so he was the first emperor to move to make Istanbul or Constantinople his capital city, if you like. And he moved. That's why it's called Constantinople, the city of Constantine. Now, during the history, this period of time and after this period of time, after 476, down the track a bit, around this time, we find that three of those ten nations, those ten horns, three of the powers were opposed to the bishops of Rome. You see what happened? These three groups, there was a group known as the Ostrogoths and the Heruli and the Vandals. You can see the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, and North Africa, the Vandals. These three powers conquered that part of the Roman Empire during each of their time. They conquered the city of Rome. Now, these were Christians in name too, the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, and the Vandals, but they had a different understanding that the Bishop of Rome had as to who Jesus was. These three powers, the Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals, their brand of Christianity was that there was a time when Jesus was not. We call that today, and there was a, was a Christian heresy, but it, these, these people took on that heresy. We call that Arianism. It means that Jesus did not always exist. They don't believe, they didn't believe that Jesus was from eternity. They said that God uh, brought him into being down through time and then he became a human being later on, but he was a time when he was not. He's not God eternal. Now, the bishops of Rome believed that he was God from eternity and they were in the middle during three different times when the Ostrogoths were in control of Rome or the Heruli or the Vandals. They're in the middle of that. And these people have a different viewpoint. Well, the way you dealt with differences of opinion with those days, you took arms. You fought it out. Now, that was never God's intention. Jesus said, if you take the sword, you perish with the sword. The words, the instruments of warfare for Christianity are the word of God. And Jesus taught that the word of God is the sword of the spirit, not the sword of the flesh, not the real sword. Now, these people had this problem. So the bishops of Rome, who were in the hot seat here, they called out to the emperors who were over in Istanbul or Constantinople. They said, send some armies over to help us get rid of these guys. And over the period of many years, the emperors from the Constantinople, who had the same religious beliefs as the Bishop of Rome, they sent armies who systematically over time completely wiped out the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, and the Vandals. When the bishop asked for help, that's what happened. And those three powers were completely wiped out. The Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths were completely dismantled. Now, the Emperor Justinian, who was ruling at the time when the final one was put down, the Emperor Justinian, who's ruling in Constantinople, he made a decree at this very time. And the decree of Justinian, the Roman emperor, was this. He made the bishop of Rome, the head bishop of Christianity, so to speak, he made this man the political and the religious leader of Western Rome. So this man becomes really, he fills the void left by the pagan emperors. Now, by the way, there were two lots of emperors, one in Constantinople who was in charge and they had these sort of like a puppet ruler in Rome until they got wiped out and now the bishop is made the real head of the Western Roman Empire by the political leader of Rome who's in Constantinople. So these bishops of Rome now, they ruled as both spiritual leaders and political leaders in this part of that Roman Empire for the next 1,260 years. Really, it wasn't the Roman Empire. It had ceased because it was only in the east. But now the religious leaders took over during the next 1260 years. And we call this in history, or historians call this, the medieval or dark age church of the dark ages, the church in the dark ages. That's what the historians refer to this period. The Christian church in Rome, who's really ruling the old Roman Empire for those 1260 years. Now, what Daniel is telling us is this. The little horn... That is the medieval dark age church. That's what Daniel tells us. Now, I'm going to give you the identification of that from Daniel itself. Now, we're not talking about a person. 
That's not what the Bible's talking about. It's talking about an institution. It's talking about a system that would take over this part of the world during these times. That's what Daniel is highlighting here. So let's go to the book of Daniel now, and let's see how Daniel makes this very clear that this is what he's talking about. Let's begin and notice these six identifying characteristics. Number one, he says, this little horn, which is the Antichrist, which is the Dark Age medieval church, he says, this power came from among the ten horns or from among Western Europe. Notice how he puts it. He says, a little one, that's the little horn, coming up among them. So whatever this little horn is, whatever this represents, it has to come from among the breakup of the old Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire. He comes up among the ten horns. Now, of course, that's exactly what happened with the medieval Dark Age church. Where did it arise? It arose in Rome there, which was right there among the ten horns. And that's how Daniel is portraying it here. Number two, he says, it arose after the ten horns or Western Europe, the nations of Western Europe. You remember, notice the ten horns, that they arose by 476 AD. But when does the medieval Dark Age church come into being? Eventually by the year 538 AD when Justinian gives him that great authority and power back in 538 AD. Now, Daniel predicts that the medieval church would replace three of the ten horns. He says these words, before, as it comes up, he says, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. So as this power comes up, three go down. And we just went through that. Exactly that's what happened. As this power came into being, three powers were completely wiped out the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, and the Vandals. And this happened by the year 538 AD, and now in their place, the medieval church was given great power. Now, Daniel says the fourth point, that this power would persecute God's people. It would sadly attack the children of God. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High and persecute the saints of the Most High. Now, if you've ever read university history of this period, you will know that's exactly what took place. In fact, even the church acknowledges that very clearly. Let me share with you one of the statements that comes from the church on this. The church has persecuted, it says, only a tyro or a novice, someone who doesn't know their history, in other words, only a tyro or a novice in church history will deny that, somebody who doesn't know their history. When she thinks it good to use physical force, she will use it. This is a statement from the church's own writing here. So clearly acknowledged by the church that this took place. Daniel was right. Daniel, 2,500 years ago, predicted that during this period, during this time period, that sadly this little horn would persecute, and it did. And it's acknowledged by the church. Daniel indicated that this power would rule for 1260 years. Notice the way he put it. Then the saints at that time, God's people shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Now you say, how on earth do you get 1260 years out of that? Good question. Let me show you how we clearly get 1260 out of a time, times, and half. We need to go to the book of Revelation. And this is where I find it fascinating. If you want to understand Daniel, you better go to Revelation. If you want to understand Revelation, you better go to Daniel. They're like a hand in a glove. By the way, there are only two books in the Bible that Jesus commanded us to understand. The first is the book of Daniel. He's looking out across the landscape of history in the future on the Mount of Olives, and he said, understand the prophet Daniel. He mentions that in Matthew 24. And of course, the book of Revelation is given by Jesus Christ himself. And he says, blessed are those that hear it, those that read it, and those that follow what it says. Two great books, both dealing with the times of the end. These are the books 
for our hour and God wants us to understand them. And by the way, when I finished here, thank, I'm so thankful that Bob is going to be running some seminars on the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation in more detail. And you'll be able to dig in there. Thousands of people have done these seminars, Secrets of Prophecy. You'll enjoy those, but we'll say more about that. So let's come back to the island of Patmos. John is here, and John sees that war between that dragon and the woman. And the woman is chased into the desert. Now notice how John portrays the time period right here. He says, The woman was given two wings of a great eagle, so that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished, now notice the time period, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Now in verse 6, he describes the same period, the same woman fleeing into the same wilderness, but now he uses a different phrase for the time period, meaning the same time period, but watch how he calls it this time. Notice what he says in verse 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there. How long? 1,260 days. John is telling us time, times and half a time is 1,260 days. We find time, times and half a time in the prophet Daniel's writings. What does that mean? It means 1,260 days. You can see how the Bible explains itself. So here we have it. Now, in Bible prophecy, you remember the great principle, a day for a year. But before we go there, so what's he saying? A time, times and half is 1260 days. And as we said, one day represents one year. Last evening after the program, and by the way, after this afternoon, second program, we'll go back again to the, uh, the function room and there'll be time for more questions, and I'm going to share with you some things relevant to what we're talking about today and yesterday that will help you. But one person last evening asked the question, How d- does a day for a year, does that mean anywhere? No, it's only in prophecy, because that's where the principle is given in prophecy. And I shared with you, Moses gave this principle when he predicted that Israel would would search the would stay in the desert for 40 day 40 years I should say every day they sent out spies 40 day now they would wander 40 years a day for a year he's told now the prophecy in Ezekiel he's also told that and we mentioned this one here from Ezekiel he's told to lie on his side for a certain number of days I've laid on you a day for each year every day you lie on the side represents a year in literal time So this is not just anywhere in the Bible. That's why when we read Genesis, the evening and the morning were the first day. That doesn't mean the evening and the morning were the year. No, because that's not a prophecy. God is just telling us how the world began. That's why when we read Jesus was in the fasted and prayed in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, it doesn't mean 40 years because it's not a prophecy. It's only in a prophetic context. So that was a very good perceptive question that was asked last evening. So now, let's put it up here. The Emperor Justinian adds political power to the Bishop of Rome's religious authority in the year 538 AD. Now, all we need to do now is add 1260, because one day represents one year, so 1260 days, 1260 years. We just need to add 1260 to 538, and we'll come to the year 1798. What happened in 1798? Something very significant happened in 1798 in European history. Napoleon Bonaparte had marched his soldiers into Italy to deal with the Bishop of Rome. And General Berthier, one of his generals, marched into the Vatican. He took the Pope prisoner and he exiled him here to Valence in France. And you can visit Valence today and you can see this history. Pope Pius VI was the Bishop of Rome who was taken prisoner by Napoleon. And when students of history and scholars and uh, students of Bible prophecy saw that event, they said, this is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy as it surely is. Right on time, 1260 years later, the bishop was taken prisoner. Now, the last characteristic is this. Daniel was told that this power would seek to change God's commandments, his 
commands dealing with, or his laws, it says. Notice what it says. He shall intend to change times and laws. And the context we just read is the most highs. So there's a power that's going to seek to change God's laws. What was one of the indicators of Antichrist? He would be opposed or he would be against Christ's laws. That's the New Testament principle. He's the lawless one, said the Apostle Paul. Now, I'm going to put something up here this afternoon, which is quite, uh, quite incredible when we start to look at it. Here, we're going to look at the commandments as we find them in the Bible. And then the commandments as they appear in even modern catechisms or teaching books of the church. And I've seen these as late as 1994 catechism and so on. When you compare these with the Bible, now a catechism is, a, is some instructions to help people to be converted to the faith. And I want you to notice what, how these commandments are given. Here we are on the left side. These are the commandments in the Bible. You will notice commandment number one in both the catechism and the Bible is you shall have no other gods before me. And that's in both of them. The second commandment in the Bible is you shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. And that's one of the longest commandments. Commandment number two. But when you go to commandment number two in the catechism, it reads, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That's actually the third commandment in the Bible. It says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord would not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Yet it's the second commandment in the catechism. In other words, the second commandment is completely absent in that part of the catechism which teaches the commandments of God. It's rather distressing when we stop and think about that. When we go to the fourth commandment in, in the Bible, you will notice it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And it's the longest of all the commandments. But the third commandment in the catechism, that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's very abbreviated. It doesn't tell us which day is the Sabbath or anything. It just says that's the, but that's the third commandment. The fifth commandment in the Bible is honor your father and your mother, but the fourth commandment in the catechism is honor your father and your mother. Well, how do you get ten commandments then? Well, here's how ten commandments seem to appear in the catechism, sadly. The Bible says the tenth commandment is you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or your, his, his house, I should say, or your neighbor's wife. But that commandment is split into two in the catechism so that number nine says you shall not covet your neighbor's wife and number ten says you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. Now, it looks like there are ten commandments, but in reality, there are only nine. That is a very sad thing because everybody knows there are ten, and it looks like there's ten, but one is missing, one that is rather obvious because one of those commandments, sadly, which says, do not bow down to images and so on, it's completely taken out of the commandment. Now, I hope this afternoon it's very clear from the book of Daniel that the little horn of his prophecy is the medieval dark age church now why should God do that is because God's upset now what's happening is this if you go to the old testament to whom is the old testament primarily directed it's directed to Israel who's supposed to be God's representative to lead people to salvation, but they are disobedient, they have turned away from God, and that's why God sends prophets. Because he hates his people? No, because he loves them and he wants to course correct. Now when we come to the New Testament, what is God's instrument to take the gospel of God's love to the world? It is the Christian church. But sadly, just as Israel would wander and did wander and went down, and so God raised prophets to bring them back sadly Jesus is predicting Paul is predicting John is predicting yea Daniel is predicting that sadly even Christianity would go downhill and do things which God never intended should happen namely attack God's people and attack God's laws do you know my friends this afternoon that we have great men and women in the medieval church to be thankful for that truth continued faithful priests faithful bishops nuns godly people in the church of rome in the dark ages 
called for the Christian church to come back to the Bible. We could spend hours here this afternoon sharing with you what they said and what they taught and what they did. But sadly, the church would not listen. And many of those people, great men of God, men like Zwingli, men like John Wycliffe in England, priests in the Church of Rome, they called for reform, but sadly, their voice fell on dead ears. And those same people, most of them, were killed for their love for Christ and his church. It's a sad story, but it's the truth. And God's word predicted it, so it's not to we're not taken by surprise so that when we see that happen, we can believe in this book. But thank God he had godly men and women and he has godly men and women today who want to bring us back to the truth of God's word. So these are the identifying characteristics. We're not talking about a person here. We're talking about an institution. We're talking about a system that God's word reveals just like Jesus talked about what was happening in the church in his day, that is the Israelite church, the church of Israel. He talked and sometimes he had to speak strong language to those leaders in Israel. Woe unto you, scribes. Did he do that because he didn't love them? No, to the contrary, he loved them and he wanted them to course correct. 